Hello everybody, Dr. Kelly here. Dr. Kelly? Oh my goodness, well then, <clears throat> this shall prove to be more formal than usual today. Uh, DK Cliff Kelly here, Scout the Wonder Dog, is chilling again down on the couch where he loves to chill. Uh, I tried to coax him up here, but he did not have none of it. Beautiful day here, <laughs> I want to say in the neighborhood. I know I'm not going to sing the song. Uh, just under 60 degrees in Colorado Springs, Colorado in the middle of January, which is unusual, but then given what we see around the country, we're used to unusual more and more. By the way, uh, as I said in one of my posts, uh, pray for California. Um, crazy out there, uh, as in other places as well, but that's my home, so it's got folks there. Um, I got uh, I got a new set of glasses. Did you notice? These are, these are those progressive things that, you know, it's a trifocal so that I can look, I don't have to take them off to look to script, da 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 da. They're fine, but my backups are my workhorse. These are my Mr. Magoos. My IQ goes up 14 points when I put these things on. <laughs> um, yeah, got them on the cheap online. Look, we're gonna pray and get on with it. Um, I say this almost every week with a, slightly in, a slight increase in intensity. Each of these lessons that I'm getting downloaded from the boss, I think, uh, are are built upon one another and increase in, maybe that's the word, intensity, urgency, um, and and hopefulness for those who follow Christ. So it's, it's not all dreary. So let's pray and get on with it. Father, I praise you and I thank you for all that is good in our lives. And I thank you and praise you to help us with all that is not good in our lives. And we all have more of that than we kind of, uh, care to think of. But we thank you, you're faithful to us, so long as we go to you with it and ask you every day, Lord, can we do a little bit better with this? We thank you and praise you for what you're gonna do today, say today, right down to the volume, the nuance, the gestures, the vocal tone. Uh, I just wanna turn it over to you, Holy Spirit, as much as humanly possible. I thank you for it. Now bring forth your truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help us, God. In Christ's name, amen. All right, the name of the uh, study today. Notes, hey, I gotta use my new specs. Notes on vindication of the righteous in 2023. God's final year of divine sifting. Now that's a little presumptuous. That last part, the uh, the, the subtitle. But I was impressed with it. I, I, I'm not setting dates. I don't know when the Lord's coming back and all that stuff, but I... It was a year or more ago that I got that Spanish word, se acabo, where the Lord began telling me, I think it was June 2021, yeah. He just began impressing me that he was wrapping things up in terms of preparation for what comes next. Um, and much of what I teach is doing the best I can to tell you what comes next as he shares it with me. The scripture today, Romans 12, 19, Beloved, never avenge yourselves. Now, most sermons stop right there. And I'll tell you why in some detail a little bit later. Listen to the rest of the passage. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave the way open for God's wrath and his judicial righteousness. For it is written in scripture, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Thank you, God, for your extraordinary work. That last part is left off. It's the closest the New Testament canon comes to imprecatory prayer. Not quite, but pretty close. Key terms that we're going to look at today, avenge, give place, wrath, and vengeance. We'll get into that later in the deep dive. Uh, three, te uh, three quotes from uh, for today. Shakespeare from The Merchant of Venice. I sort of relate to this in a way. I am a Jew, hath not a Jew eyes. In, in the context of vastly increased anti-Semitism. I am a Jew, hath not a Jew eyes, hath not a Jew hands, organs, dimensions, senses, affections, passions, fed with the same food, hurt with the same weapons, subject to the same diseases, healed by the same means, warmed and cooled by the same winter and summer as a Christian is. If you prick us, do we not bleed? If you tickle us, do we not laugh? If you poison us, do we not die? And if you wrong us, do we not revenge? If we are like you in the rest, we will resemble you in that as well. 
Second one from one of my favorites. I've quoted it a number of times over the years. Jonathan Edwards, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, delivered, I think it was the second time, 1741. First time he said it, <laughs> nothing. Fell on the floor and died. Second time, uh, heaven lit, lit the place up with fire. Here's the, st here's the comment. Quote, The bow of God's wrath is bent. I absolutely believe it, beloved. And the arrow made ready on the string, and justice bends the arrow at your heart and strains in the bow. And it is nothing but the mere pleasure of God and that of an angry God without any promise or obligation at all that keeps the arrow one moment from being made drunk with your blood. The word of the Lord. Then here's a quote from an individual. I'll hold his name for just a few moments. He'll guess it on the first three words. This is from uh, an article by Mother Jones, October 19, 2016. Now, there are a lot of bad people out there. If you have a problem, if you have a problem with someone, you have to go after them. And it's not necessarily to teach that person a lesson. It's to teach all of the people that are watching a lesson that you don't take crap. And if you take crap, you're just not going to do well. But if you can't take a lot of nonsense from people, you have to go after them. It's terribly unfair to follow Shakespeare and Jonathan Edwards with a statement like this from America's beloved Donald John Trump. Trump. So to first thoughts. If we're being honest, virtually every human being in the world doesn't want to suffer pain. Put me at the front of that line. I've been through some stuff in the last 10 days. I've told the Lord any number of times, as reverently as I can, let's not do that again for a long time, sir, please. We just want to be happy. Remember that song, and I listened to it a hundred times, I love the song, by Pharrell Williams, Pharrell Williams. Happy, just want to be happy. People are dancing in the street. It, it, it's uplifting. It's fun. And it was uh, diverse and joyful. I think it is overwhelmingly normal to want to be happy. It's in our founding documents. Uh, but that word is not in the founding documents of the Old Testament. It's not there. The psalmist and others write about joy and that sort of thing, but it's not there. Jesus never called us to be happy as his first command. Did you know that? You wouldn't know that by looking at the American church today. So, I have a section here called The Pursuit of Happy Church. I'm sorry. I'm so irreverent when I turn to this stuff. I'm probably going to take a beating at the judgment. But just call me your resident iconoclast. Uh, I mentioned before that I see a major trend in especially charismatic and Pentecostal churches, but also in the evangelicals. And that is, over the last 10, 15 years especially, a tree, I've got this sociology background, this social theory background, so I see this stuff as part of my professional responsibilities, trends, uh, ebbs and flows. I see this tremendous increase only in the last maybe five, six years. Tremendous emphasis upon praise and worship. Now don't call me a heretic yet. Of course praise and worship is biblical, both in Old and New Testaments. No, that's not what I'm saying. Do you know you can make an idol out of almost anything? Even, even, even this, I'll make that case a little strangely a little bit later. No, it's 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 praise and worship, and and you we've got to work the people up into a, a, a almost an ecstatic froth. I'm not kidding. In order to achieve what the New Agers would say, communion with the God Ed. Pastors would say to please the Lord and if they were really being honest, to open the gateway to blessing, prosperity, and success. And I guess that wouldn't be so bad. The accoutrement of lights and flashes and smoke machines and all that crap notwithstanding. And that's what it is, by the way. The Bible will call it dung if you don't like that word. That wouldn't be so bad. But it's more often than not, almost invariably in my experience, followed by a 27-minute 
on a good day presentation that is paper thin theologically or or an old an old file that was dragged out a sermon you heard 40 years ago and redone a little bit and it's shameless worse sin sin I don't hear mentioned unless it's about the Democrats and the liberals and the socialists and the sinners outside the gates, outside the tent. Came across a tidy little essay by a pastor, not well known, Chip Ingram. Uh, in his blog, Living on the Edge, I retrieved it just January 9th. Listen to what he says. He makes me sound like a choir boy. When we look in the Old Testament <laughs> and read how easily the Israelites were seduced into idol worship, it's easy for us to judge. I've never come home after a long day of work and said to my wife, honey, just stay right here. I put a little statue in the back room and now I'm going to go to pray, pray to it. But if we take the time to look at our own hearts a little closer, we're really not that different from the children of Israel. Honestly, I've worshipped a lot of mental idols. Again, unfortunately put me at the front of that line. I'm not going to tell you. It's between me and Jesus. Idols like success, family, education, prosperity, money, comfort, self-fulfillment. Big one in my whole career. I'm still paying the price for that one. And in the process of pursuing these idols, here's the point that he makes, exquisite point. Let me emphasize it. And in the process, blah, 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 blah. I want to read it and get it right. I lost my place. Ah, and in the process of pursuing these idols, the focus on God goes where? Somewhere else. This is my life. Achievement. A name on the door that says Speaker of the House. Perhaps. Case study of this sort of thing. He finishes his essay, as a pastor, I see this not only in my life, but also in the life of the church. Many of our, man, he just, I love this guy. Many of our churches today are infected with what I call the happiness cult. They're always smiling, telling a joke, lighthearted story, basketball allegories. Uh, dear Lord, it's like the gong show I used to watch years ago on TV. I hate it. I think God hates it. If he ever comes in the sanctuary, he'd leave at that point. This isn't him. This is not me. What is this? It's performance Christianity. That's what it is. And he detests it, and so do I. Expanding on this nearly universal pursuit of happiness, remember the movie with the Y instead of the I? Will Smith. It's a lovely movie, really. A true story of a uh, a down and out guy who made it in the stock market. It's a lovely movie, and I recommend it. And, you know, regarding Mr. Smith, he has repented over and over and over again. And he's being hated and vilified more and more and more. He's got a new movie out. I think it's about the Civil War. I intend to see it. That kind of repentance, as far as I can tell, and anguish is what God will honor. I will do. I think he means it. I'm going to go see his movie. You do what you want. Anyway, I came across this uh, Moody Institute trained pastor, Jack Wellman. Quoted him before. He's solid, solid stuff. I like him uh, in, in his journal, uh, Faith in the News. He points out six false idols that American churchgoers are guilty of, especially their pastors. One, being, and I can't do it all. It's very detailed. Uh, so you get rich red meat here, but I can't go through all of it. Uh, first one, being relevant. <laughs> Boy, I could just go on a tear with this one. I actually heard one pastor say that we can't be preaching the Bible to people in the world because it's not relevant to them. What? I have to admit I was angered by that, he goes on. Does this pastor think he has more power than the Word of God to save? Has he invented a better way? Yeah, the way we dress, the way we look, I mean, you know, hot shot, muscle tight t-shirts and torn jeans like everybody wears and, you know, hip haircuts, golly Moses, Andrew, Mary, and Joseph. Maybe it's because I'm almost 80. I hate it. I want to say one more thing about that. Why do I dress the way I do? He told me to. No, not down to the garment and the details. I don't know the phrasing. It was more or less approach my 
pulpit, my lectern, with dignity. That means not only what you say, but also how you appear. I could say more about that, but it's very private between me and the Lord. I'm not trying to dress up more fancy tie in a you know, Brooks Brothers suit. No, that's not what I'm talking about. But I've actually said in the middle of a sermon to a young hipster at 37 years old, you know, put a tie on or something. I'm so tired of the hipster-looking pastor. Their rationale is, well, Jesus didn't dress up either. You know what he dressed like? I just prayed about it this morning. He dressed like a rabbi. No, not the, the high priest in the temple. No, no. He dressed in the uh, appropriate garb of a rabbi. Always dignified. Now, there are several versions historically what that looked like. He didn't come hipster baby. Neither should you. Self-improvement. This comes, number two, this comes close to being found in every prosperity gospel I have ever heard. Your life will be better and you will be happier if you just accept Jesus. <laughs> I love this. He says, oh really? My life got harder immediately after I became a Christian. And that is my experience as well. Alongside the good stuff that comes along. The, the rebuilding of a broken life and heart and worldview and relationships. But we've got this seller, carney barker approach. You know, come to Jesus, pfft, everything's going to be incredible. I don't know how many shattered lives there are who listen to that garbage and found out that wasn't true. It was a lie. But it's all, you know, get them get in the church. And ultimately, bottom line, he says it's all about love for self. Are we appealing to Christ and honoring him? No. We're appealing to you. You're, you're what it's all about, not God. Third, we are all God's children. Hogwash. We are not all God's children. Not everyone was a Jew either in the Old Testament era. That's a that's a secular sort of new agey. We're all God's children. No, no, no. The restrictions and definitions of what a children, a child of God, Jesus Christ is, are fairly that restrictive. Go and look them up. But this idea is syncretism again, my favorite word to hate. Let's embrace all religions. Let's just get everybody whatever is common and put it together called heresy. Fourth, pastors and preachers. This guy's got some spine. Once a pastor gets too full of himself and starts believing all of his own stuff, especially if it's in a mega church with 14,000 folks and a $33 million budget and grounds that are just landscaped to beat the band and elegant and wow. Once that happens, he says, rightly, it's so easy to get caught up in a person who pastors a large church or preaches great sermons as in, and is on TV and radio. I can't watch any of them. I mean, I just can't. I turn on uh, my, my, the channel that I use to watch uh, Gunsmoke and, and my favorite TV show ever. I, I want to take it to heaven. Um, and Wagon Train and, and uh, Rifleman and others. Uh, it's also a religious station, but they only say the religious stuff for real early in the morning, like 5 a.m. They got these 2010 camp meeting things where this guy who looks like Satan incarnate, can't remember his name, maybe that's better, comes out and holds up one of his several books on how to make money, 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 money. Tells all these stories about how rich he is, how God gave him seven seven Porsches or, or no, seven gold watches or seven Rolls Royces. I mean, it makes you want to vomit, so I just wait till gun smoke comes on. Vastly more spiritual. Pastors as demigods. My old pastors won't talk to me. I've told you before. Well, we can't engage with you, Cliff. You're much too negative. I've got the truth! I've turned, I said I'll, I'll turn over all my 300 uh, pre well prepared, documented. Files to you free. Well, actually, for the price of coffee and a and a donut, pastry. Can't get them to talk to me. That's an abomination before God. It's called pride, and it will destroy those pastors if they don't get off their own bench and stand up for Christ. At the same time, bow down low enough for us little people to talk to them. Six, Bible translations. You ever heard of, I'm a King James. If you're in the audience, I'm going to nail you to the wall. There is no King James 
Christian. Do you know that? There's not a New American Standard Bible Christian. There's, a, there's not a New International Version Christian. There's not an ESV or an NA... Uh, it is true that some translations are more accurate. I prefer New American Standard for that reason. I also prefer the more literary and more elegant New King James Version. And I use, as you know, a whole lot of the, uh, the Amplified and the Amplified Classic Editions. I use all kinds of... I use the Living Bible. Don't you dare say it's this Bible or none. Don't do it. My take. All of this, bottom line again, is reducible down to self-worship. Christian, American Christianity has become all about me, moi, this, this, this guy. There was a, I don't know if it's still in print, there was a magazine not too long ago called Self. I think that was the name. Self, maybe? Yeah. Kind of says it all. And if you go to the bookstores, Christian bookstores, I can't, I can't hardly stand those any more than I can stand to listen to Christian radio. I mean, it's just all fluff. And a lot of it is self-help. Whatever happened to... Letting God take care of this stuff, like a 20-year addiction and horrible things in my life, or, and just seeking Him. What did He say? It's not in the text. Seek first the kingdom of the Lord and what? All this other stuff be added. You seek Him first and foremost. Not how to help you all the time. Watch the difference if you make that shift. The coming persecution. Here's the happy part. Some of this will not surprise you. Some of it will. I'm going to blow open the lid on some of the junk that's been going on underneath the surface in the American now politicized Trump Christian camp. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Never Trump movement and finding out what happens if you oppose Trump in a sustained way and uh, what the church and the Republican Party will do to you. I'm going to get down here to uh, a short history of the Never Trump movement. I'm going to do a case study on somebody you know who was the head of that, or, or head of a great part of that. Uh, I'm going to give you a little intro from Wikipedia. I use it a lot. I give them a little money now and then. I prefer it over almost every Christian publication that exists. The Never Trump movement, also called the Never Trump, Stop Trump, Anti-Trump, or Dump Trump movement, began as an effort on the part of a group of Republicans known as Never Trump Republicans and other prominent true conservatives at the time to prevent Republican frontrunner front runner Donald Trump from obtaining the party nomination. Trump remained at this time unsupported, uh, this is in 2016 now, uh, by 20% of Republican members of Congress. That means 80% supported him. He went in strong. Then I have a section here called Trump and Machiavelli. If you've not read Machiavelli's Prince, 1615, what is it? I got it somewhere. 16th century. Then I think it would be good for you to read at least a summary of it because it now exists as the political algorithm of the Republican Party. To say it another way, we're in a great regress now spiral downward into the politics of Machiavelli's medieval political algorithms. It is a return, a time of return to brute authoritarianism, the most bloody and undeniable evidence of which is January 6, 2021 insurrection that is still being buried in all Christian circles that I know of. It's never talked about. It's gone. It's a leaf in the wind. You have no idea. You have no idea. It's coming back. This is the very essence, by the way, of what Christ himself prophesied would permeate the last days. We ought not to be surprised about it, but we are. I am. And dismayed about it, angered about it, heartbroken about it. It's called lawlessness. And Jesus and the prophets and the law and the, uh, uh, the uh, evangelists what am I saying? The law, the prophets, Jesus, and the apostles all told you that this would happen toward the end of history. Now we see it all around us. It's, it, it, it's shaken us down to our socks. It really has. We can hardly believe it. The word comes from anomia, violation of God's order. And there's another definition. 
whatever's going on is called violation of God's order. And it's in the Church of Jesus Christ in America today. And I don't mean Latter-day Saints. Although them too. From the Prince we learn one narrative, and you can remember this if you don't ever read it. I don't know why I didn't, Dave. 16th century political treatise. Here's the narrative. Glory and survival. Now think politics now. Think Christian politics today. Glory and survival can justify the use of immoral means to achieve those ends. If Donald Trump can stop abortion, he can murder 40,000 others to get there. Try selling that to Jesus at the judgment when you're interviewed face to face about your rationale for supporting a beast. You try that out. Stand in front of the mirror now and try that out. See how that flies. If the Holy Ghost doesn't descend in that room, hopefully, and correct your twisted, perverse reasoning. It's called pragmatism. Raw, bloody pragmatism. I can do anything I want to get to the goal. You're not going to find that in the Bible. A return to darkness. For us to embrace the Machiavellian political Machiavellian political model. I used to study this in graduate school before I was a Christian. There was a test, a psychology test called uh, Big Max and Little Max. The high Machiavellian, we would measure on a scale. I think I scored high on the Mac, Max scale back then in the 70s. Who took this approach to living? Manipulate everything to get what you want. For us to embrace this political model, however, we enjoy nothing less than the utter rejection of 1,000 years of Christian common law tradition beginning with the Magna Carta of 1215 agreed to by King John of England at Runnymede when he began to turn over some of his kingly power to the people. Before that, 3,400 years ago, we're, it's a rejection of the law given to Moses at Sinai. We're rejecting everything in America today. And it's increasing and accelerating by the men. We're not returning to anything except this medieval darkness. Chuck Colson wrote a book, it's not in the text, published in 1999, 1989, I believe. I used it in class for a number of years. And now I can't remember the name of the book. Against the Night. Extraordinary book. Read it. Uh, case study. Okay. You know this name real well. Kendall Casey Unruh. Your friend and mine. An incredibly courageous woman. I uh, asked her permission before I talked about her to put this online. And Kendall, if it's not accurate, I was going to say it's not my fault. It is entirely my fault. I went to the records, 90% of it, just the, the written record, and and uh, she may tune in, she may not, if, if there are any inaccuracies. I call her the first canary in the coal mine, but Kendall, if you're going to watch or listen, I'm going to call you the second canary in the coal mine. You know why? What happened to you happened in July 2016. I beat you by four months. I got nailed in March. Anyway, no. You really earned that title, First Canary in the Coal Mine. You still, you still own it. Here's a brief summary. I think it's again from, uh, where is this from? Well, it's documented here somewhere. Um, better check that. I'll just read snippets. Free the Delegates was an American political effort within the Republican Party formed in June 2016 by Delegate and Rules Committee member Kendall Unruh to the 2016 Republican National Convention, July 18, 21, 2016. With the goal of nominating a candidate other than Donald Trump. There's a lot of details that will follow about procedures. Uh, by June 19, hundreds of delegates to the Republican Convention had begun raising funds and recruiting members to support this effort. And she started out with something like 15, ended up for several hundred. She was on a roll. She was on a roll of denying the nomination to what may prove to be the Antichrist of the Scriptures. <laughs> you know, Kendall, you don't lack for, for guts. Speaker of the House and Chairman at the time of the 2016 convention, Paul Ryan, appeared to give support. Scott Walker, Governor Walker, remember him? Oh, yeah. He gave support to free the delegates. Then there was Senator Gordon Humphrey who endorsed it. And then the other one who stayed true was John McCain, the late John McCain who told the Weekly Standard, I think it's up to every delegate to make up their own minds. One man. And he's dead. Trump stormtroopers. Sadly, tragically, beyond my own ability to express the devastation that this did 
to church and state in a few months. On a day, in a day, as you'll see in a minute. Here's the on-the-record on report from Yoni Applebaum, The Atlantic, July 18, 2016. And I quote, But the effort fell apart. It needed support from a majority of seven state delegations. The dissidents, it's us, said they submitted signatures from 11. The chair recognized only nine. And then Trump loyalists convinced enough delegates to rescind their support by strong-arming them, no question about it, that only six remained. The effort failed because most Republicans in Cleveland have come around to embrace Trump as their nominee. As 80 to 90 percent of what I think is the corrupt American Church of America. Oh, you won't hear him. This is what you hear all the time. Oh, I don't like Trump. The minute you hear that, leave the room. I don't like his ways. But. But. A lot of buts in the church and the party today. Couldn't help myself. <clears throat> then a little bit later, the delegates cheered. Rudolph Giuliani, you know, the hero of the Republican right. They greeted Trump with a thunderous ovation. They embraced retired Lieutenant General Mike Flynn's attack on Hillary, chanting, lock her up, lock her up, and they hailed Melania Trump's brilliant eloquence and optimistic positive speech. Off the record, Kendall, this is where I venture off the reservation. It may not be right, but I think it's essentially true. From several sources that I will not name, this is what I got. I have gathered from those confidential sources that there was a darker side in the back room while all this was going on. In a private face-to-face -face confrontation, I don't know if anybody else was in the room, Kendall, between Reince Priebus, I have a name for him, I can't say in public, um, L-W-N, that's how long you give you. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, and Kendall. Though there is no verbal transcript available, obviously, <coughs> the sense that I got very clearly was Priebus telling Unruh in no uncertain terms if she continued her movement. I shouldn't have placed this, in, these are not in quotes, they're in single quotes. That means I don't know if it's true. Verbally, a verbatim. It will be not be good for you, Kendall. Continue this effort. Now, I'll only say this, and this straight from Kendall because it can be documented. I don't think she ever stopped receiving death threats after. Hundreds, 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 hundreds. From who? The Democrats, the Libs? Trump's people. Every time I tell a Republican that I stopped counting mine at 73, it's like, it's like a Star Wars movie, you know, where he, you know, it just goes right through them. Not one has registered. Oh my God, are you kidding? Not once in six years. Not once. What is that? What is that? So I have the next section, the coming persecution. Here's my thesis. I won't go through all of it. Whatever happened to Kendall, whatever happened to me and others, it's coming to your door. If you take a stand against Donald Trump, it's coming to your door. You ready for that? You got the backbone for that? You have the commitment to Christ for that? Will you stand for that? Unto life, unto death? Are you ready for that? In fairness, if you're not, go and pray about it. I told you it took me months, maybe a couple of years, to come to terms with that. That's, that's serious stuff. You know what that is? That's real Christianity, down to the bone. Not this crap you hear in sanctuaries all the time. That's the real stuff. That's the stuff of the early church, the apostles, church fathers, the martyrs over the centuries. That's real faith. And if you don't have it, understandable. If you dare, <laughs> with fear and trembling in your knees shaking, ask him for it, beloved. Ask him for it. You'll never know that kind of Christianity unless you do. John Gill writes, in response to Psalm 123.4, which I quote here, to summarize this whole sort of thing, our life is exceedingly filled with the scorning and scoffing of those who are at ease and with the contempt of the proud. 
irresponsible tyrants who disregard God's law. That's who's threatening you, Kendall. That's who threatens me. Tyrants. I don't give a rip what they call themselves or what position they hold in politics or the church. Doesn't matter to me. It sure doesn't matter to Almighty God, except their judgment would be vastly more severe if they do this and hold that position. James 3, one. John Gill writes, Our soul is exceedingly filled with the scorning of those that are at ease. You know, you look at them, they, they seem to be fine, they're happy. That are in easy and affluent circumstances abounding in the things of this world and have more than their heart can wish. Boy, this is so relevant to what's become of American Christianity. White and other colors too, American Christianity. It's true. Brother, you know what I'm talking about. There's this a line here. Excuse me. I love Ricola, honey flavored lozenges. Satan. This was written when? 1746 by John Gill. Of those, Satan has complete possession of them. They are of their father, the devil. They keep the goods in peace, and their consciences are seared as with a red hot iron, and they are past feeling. Beloved, who are proud of their natural abilities and through their pride persecute the poor saints with their reproaches and by other ways, including threats, death to them and their families. Christians, Republicans, conservatives, yeah. Your heroes and mine, right? Not mine, the teaching. Gotta go fast as usual. From Romans twelve nineteen. Skip down a few paragraphs. If we're being honest, most of us are frustrated and are angry. The few of us that, that admit to what's going on that I'm talking about today. And sometimes it just crushes us. There are moments when you and I have just said, God, I just don't know if I can deal with this. It's so big and so vast. Just like he said it would. The great falling away. Matthew 24, 13, I think. I'm not sure. And the narrative under the American church today, don't ever say these things, Dr. Kelly. Never judge, never fight back, only love. You need to love more, Dr. Kelly. Don't you understand that what I'm doing is love? See, if you tell the truth, I used to have a phrase, I don't know if it'll watch theologically, love always tells the truth. Now it tells it in different ways, different volumes. Um, I'm working with people in the world, some gay kids, and. Uh, I, I, one of them is just shattered and broken right now. I won't name her name. I'm just offering her. I, I need to modify my algorithm here just a little bit. Love should lead with those that are broken and don't know Christ. Truth should lead with those who know Christ and know better. That's the way I differentiate. It's from Paul's admonition, I become all things all men to win some. You adjust the message. Lead with truth, lead with love, depending. But both have to be in the equation with God's power as part of that trinity. So I'm going to go to just some key terms, and this is under the vindication of righteousness. Here's what God promises you, beloved, if you'll stand for him. This is what he says. First of all, first directive, never avenge yourselves. I don't have time. There's a whole section here on the Regent University lawsuit that I was a participant of. If you want to know what I'm really not made of, you can read about that. I won't have time to go into it. You can read about it. Never avenge. Never take revenge for yourself. We want to. Might feel good for a few minutes. Not a good idea. It's from the Greek term ekdikeo. To vindicate, retaliate, or punish. To execute justice. To vindicate one's cause. Second, but allow for wrath. Wait a minute, Dr. Kelly. That's not my Jesus. He's all love, 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 love. No, he's also justice. He's also righteousness. He's also wrath. 
He's also holiness. We don't hear that anymore. That God, that was another Jesus. I beg to differ. Allow for wrath, closest we come to a precatory prayer, <coughs> is defined in this invocation of evil punishment for another. King David prayed it often, but Christians are allowed to use it only under very restrictive circumstances. You say it can't run around cursing people. But it's from the Greek orge. Orge is an interesting... It is the one word in the uh, Greek Testament that is a description of God's unmitigated wrath. Orge. To act on impulse and anger or passion, severe punishment or vengeance, settle opposition. That's not for you to ever take. Maybe in self-defense in critical circumstances in a war zone or somebody threatening you or your family. It's another matter. We'll talk about that some other time. But as a general rule, no. Who has authority to do that? Almighty God. Jehovah. Yeshua ben David. That's who. And you know, it makes so much sense when you don't know how to respond to somebody who's just tearing you apart or your family or your friends or your neighbor. What do I do, God? This is what you do. Paul did it. Several times in the Testament. I turn them over to Satan. To kill them? No. If that's the last resort so that they can be saved from the fire, according to Jude. The motive has to be, yeah, and I do. I, I, I love justice. I love seeing somebody who savaged somebody get their due. That's normal. That's part of the God in us. But not to celebrate it and you know, live on that and take joy in that. Oh, there's Lincoln. <laughs> Bassett Hound, friend of scouts. Um, that's for God to do. And then finally I have, I think it's right, divine providence, which means where does this originate? Here's the core requirement. Only God repays. Take it from the term, I don't think I can do this one. Antabotidomi. To requite good or evil recompense to give back as equivalents. From the concept of lex talionis, eye for an eye that most people don't understand until I researched it, I didn't either. Payback, severe penalty to render justice to compensate, recompense for terrible deeds. Matthew Poole writes, snippets, dearly beloved, he uses this friendly compilation, that's to those of us who remain faithful, to the to the to the church and Christ, avenge not yourselves. Uh, well, you can read that. That's kind of self evident. Second, but rather give place unto wrath. Here's what he writes: I.e., say some your own wrath. Be not angry. No, 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 no. And I hear that a lot from me. You know, don't ever be angry. Just oh, oh, oh. That's a terrible thing. And it can be. That's not what the text contextually is saying and teaching out. Here's what he writes, but it is better referred to as, the, in this context, the wrath of God. Clearly, we're talking about God's anger, which they seem to prevent who seek revenge. Suffer God to vindicate and right to avenge you of your adversaries. Do you have that right when you're being pummeled and beaten to death? Yes, but not for you to take revenge. Let God handle it. Every now and then. It made me think of two instances. I've mentioned them before. I've had two people come back to me over the years, over this Trump stuff, and make rapprochement, listening again. And it's precious. That's the unity and the reconciliation that delights God. It's not about winning. It's about obeying the king. The Regent lawsuit, I have a section here. I don't have time to... Uh, 1995 for a number of reasons just to gloss over it a little bit uh, Pat Robertson Herb Titus and the board of trustees at Regent back then they decided for a number of reasons you can look it up it's on the record to just overnight without telling the faculty uh, destroy all tenure rights that's right now you don't have to be a fan of tenure but you ought to be a fan of due process they shattered us. I had been tenured at University of Pacific. I was tenured a second time at Regent University. I worked very hard for it. And overnight, disappeared. Some of us foolishly went into a lawsuit against Robertson and the board, and uh, we lost. 
and I'll just summarize it. There were twin violations in what we did. It seemed right to me. I was a young Christian. It seemed right, but it wasn't. One, Robertson's board. I hope you're listening, Pat. hope you're listening. I went back and made peace with it. But on reflection, this is what God told me to teach about you. Robertson's board violated the respect of their faculty by operating in an authoritarian manner, ruling with an iron fist in a place that ought to be governed by truth and grace, Pat. Second, we the defendants, however, violated the principle discussed today by taking our own revenge and infirm that it was affirmed in a passage that God showed me and I published in a, in a journal and uh, went to law classes to teach from 1 Corinthians 6, 1 and 7. Dare, Paul writes, Dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? Should have been handled in-house, but it wasn't. A couple of lawyers going at it, duking it out and recruiting idiots like me. Now, therefore, it is already an utter failure for you that you go to law against one another. Why do you not rather accept the wrong? Why do you not rather let yourselves be cheated if it's in the house of God or mediated in the house of God? Remediated. Update, Mr. Tamala. <laughs> ah, he's a former Marine, straight as an arrow. <laughs> Jeff is currently professor of law at Liberty University in Lynchburg, Virginia. Dr. Waller is pastor of Abundant Life Ministries in Virginia Beach. I went over several of her sermons online. Couldn't find a single peep about this entire matter. Sorry, Elaine. It's there or it's not. And Dr. Kelly is a digital circuit writer based in Colorado Springs, remaining virtually unemployable in all Christian circles for perpetuity. Uh, last thought. Hoy vey. Fighting fair. So, how do we fight fair? How, how does a Christian who's being persecuted, maligned, and even threatened with death, does this, do the scriptures allow us to fight back? Yeah. But the restrictions are clear. Here are a few. By the way, to contextualize, there are two extreme responses in the American church today about about this current spiritual war, social uh, cultural war as well, raging all around us. The most prevalent one, and the, what the church has decided to do, run and hide. That makes it. Everything's fine. Everything's like it's always been. Well, maybe not. You know, COVID was bad. But. The other one is to fight fire with fire and join the stormtroopers and fight like they do. Neither one will wash at the judgment. Neither one. Your silence and cowardice or your picking up Satan's sword won't work. Here's what will work. This is what I title Fighting Fair. Number one, this is just for me now over centuries of experience. Covenant with God that you will give your entire life effort to his cause as your prime directive for all of your life. Let go of everything. That's the start. Second, spend quality... <clears throat> I don't even like this phrase, quality time with Jesus. Yeah, I get my little devotion. Uh, you know, I'll just hunker down 15 minutes with, you know, streams in the desert and everything's fine. No, that won't do in a war. That won't do in a war. Spend quality time with God, I define this way. Every single day, not just by throwing together a 17-second prayer or a glimpse of a religious meme now and then. No, no, real time. Real conversation, real study, real listening, every day. No scriptures for each of these. I've told you several times it's revolutionized my life. I didn't start doing this until 2016 and 17 when I lost, began to lose everything. Had nowhere else to go. Man. When I use this stone, I'm not talking material, what a payoff. It's called freedom, liberty in Christ. To do what you need to do and to say what you need to say. Third, clarify his instructions as they are made plain to you. It's different for everybody. By this significantly increased commitment to God. You start listening to him every day. Guess what he's going to do? He's going to talk. Listening to what he has to tell you about your life, your purpose, and even your daily activities. Ask him to guide them all. And keep a journal. Keep a journal. 
for each encounter and date it. Fourth and finally, then having done all that, wait. Hardest part. You've given it all to him. You've shared your heart. Now wait. You are only to act when he specifies a particular course of action. Otherwise, you commit all to him in prayer and then leave room for wrath or grace. God decides, not you. Allowing Almighty God and not you to determine which shall be appropriate to the crisis or the condition. Which is clarified in the scripture that now follows. Which is called our vindication. I got this from Zechariah 2.13 just toward the end of this study. And I felt like I needed to add it as part of the conclusion. Be still before the Lord all mankind. For he is roused. The king. The Lord, the Lion of Judah, is roused. He is now stirred to action from his holy habitation in, listen to this, in response to his persecuted people. That's why I'm teaching this, beloved. 2023 is going to be brutal. But for you who stand with Christ, he's going to begin to vindicate you gradually, of course. And it's not going to be all peaches and cream. But your vindicator, has been roused and he's coming to set things right and it will take longer than a year to set it all right but it starts this year i believe it starts this year and you can take hope from that and it's not just to see your enemies destroyed at all no it's the, the joy of it is what i said in these two encounters when two of them came back we can now sit at table and have coffee and we can talk openly about why this and why that and why we go this way that's the beauty of the possibility of leaving wrath or grace to god he's smarter than we are and more loving and more furious depending as one eloquent commentary put it let all in silent awe and reverence await the Lord's coming interposition in behalf of his people, his true followers. I quote it every day, Exodus 14, 14. He will fight for you while you remain quiet. Final word. Now, I'm going out on a, 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 a little tiny branch on a limb, on a limb, on a limb, on this one. I've never done this. But as I was preparing this study, man, I heard a word as clear as almost as somebody being in the room. I wrote it down. Didn't intend to share it until I got to the last page, and I felt like a prompt to share it. This is as close to a prophecy as you'll ever hear me saying. We'll just call it a word. Saturday morning, 5 a.m., January 7th, 2023. This is what I heard the Lord say. You test this severely. Quote, The voice said this you are descending into a year filled with torments and terrors my people must prepare for what is coming but most of them are not ready and they will be swept away father if this isn't you you let us know momentarily may god help me i believe it to be one of the words of the lord for 2023 i think it's going to be rough but the, the delight the joy the security and the promises. God will be fighting for every single one of you who's been wronged and he will bring the restitution, the recompense, the, the grace, the fury, the wrath, whatever is required. He is, after all, the sovereign. He's the king. He's the judge. He decides. We are to judge in limited measure among ourselves, not on the outside. If somebody is inside the house teaching terrible things, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let it be known. <clears throat> it's one of my responsibilities. But the larger judgments, the final assessments, are by him. Obviously. So those are my thoughts. Those are my hopes. Those are my concerns. Those are my theories. And my gentle moments. I don't know for what reason I've been... Well, you know tearing up a lot in my early morning devotion. I am so, let me end this way. I am so grateful beyond description in human words for what God has done in rescuing me from a condition that I liken to hell. 
that I dwelled in for, I don't know, about 30, 40 hours. Not long. It's long enough for me. And his rescue and his uh, grace. I still don't know if I have cancer or not, but I feel like a million bucks. I give all the glory and the praise to him and the 150 or 70 or so of you who prayed for the old man and our family. Uh, praying for my son right now in the Philippines. He's um, can't say too much because in public uh, conditions in the Philippines are not good. Uh, he's already been uh, pulled over by. I better just stop right there. Just keep him in prayer. His safety. <clears throat> Uh, my wife is doing well. She <laughs> bruised her tailbone in a fall. N nothing serious. My daughter is fighting her struggles with Crohn's, but uh, she's getting very close to a place and pray for her as well. Uh, the ER where she works as an admissions tech, even though she has a bachelor's in psychology, uh, has uh, she's done such an extraordinary job there. They're offering a full ride, three-year crash study and becoming an RN to return to work there. They'll pay for everything. And I am blessed. I told the Lord this morning, I have never lived in my 78 years in a moment where I have felt more fulfilled, more joy to get up in the morning on my good days, non-sick days. I just love what the Lord is doing in our lives in this family. A lot of it's painful, but most of it's grand. That's kind of the walk. That's kind of the walk. Uh, there was a psychologist, I'll end with this. Uh, trying to remember his name. A social psychologist at Harvard who said he, he gave a sort of a ratio to life. Secular guy, Robert F. Bales. You can look him up, Robert F. Bales, B-A-L-E-S. And he said, for most human lives, he was talking about group life specifically, you're in great shape or relational life. If two thirds of your life is going about business and you know you're doing pretty well, and one third of your life is mediating crisis or relationship hassles, or, that's about right for me. I think that's a pretty good ratio, 70 to 30, I'll take that. Most of my days are more like 80 to 20. I'll take those odds from Christ and I'll suffer those 20% for him or more because I know he's good, and I know he's God, and I know he has a plan for these last hours, not only for the planet, but for you and me. Father, I thank you and praise you for the words of truth that come. I ask you to expunge the record for any words of untruth that I've mistakenly poured out. I love these people. Let uh, I thank you for the, the listeners on YouTube and the viewers who read uh, It's Expanding. Um, I thank you and praise you for let that for letting that expanse take place. I also have seen a couple of interlopers who come in as fake accounts who want to destroy, and you've told me what to do with those accounts with dispatch, and I do those as well. We need to be wise as serpents and innocent as doves in this hour, and you're just the one to make it so. In Jesus' name, amen. Love you guys. Back to my heavy duties. 14 points uh, in my IQ magically go up when I when I put them up. Anyway, God bless you. I love you. And uh, I'll be responding to the threads as you. Bye-bye.